So, could you take your seats? Okay, well, we, we will start. And uh, I have to say that we have a question which is extremely stimulating. <laughs> is international economic order collapsing? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> and we are very privileged because to respond to this question, we have a group of panelists, uh, extremely uh, uh, diverse, with an uh, angle of visions that are complementary, very different, and I take it that uh, to respond to a question which is so multidimensional, so multi-layered, uh, it is good that we have such a panel. Let me introduce the member of the panel. We have Taeo Park. Uh, he was Minister of Trade of the Korean government. I note with great satisfaction that uh, Taeo is chair of the Korean Committee for the Trilateral Commission. I note that en passant. <laughs> He's uh, presently president of the Global Commerce Institute of, uh, uh, and a leading global law firm in Korea, Leonard Ko. Uh, Jan Kotensen is CEO of DataCore Innovations, a limited liability company, member of the board of the Paris School of Economics, and he just published Capitalism Against Inequalities, which is a great book, I have to say. Uh, Gabriel Felber May, uh, he is uh, he was the, the I would say chief of the famous IFO Center for International Economics at the University of München at Munich, and he was uh, president of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. He's presently director of the Austrian Institute of Economic Research, and it's a privilege to have you here. Motoshige Ito, professor emeritus of the University of Tokyo has been an advisor of the Prime Minister, and I have to say, I was very impressed when I could see your own personal library <laughs> with the 40 books that you wrote. <laughs> very impressive. John Lipsky is, uh, was deputy, first deputy uh, managing director of the IMF, acting managing director, and is presently senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute at uh, John Hopkins, uh, Paul Nitzer School of Advanced International Studies. And then we have Kiao Ide, Secretary General and Vice Chairman of Shanghai Development Research Foundation, dedicated to promote research and the issue of development. He previously was Managing Director of New York Life in China. Nicolas Veron, Last but not least, senior fellow both at Bruegel in Brussels and at the Peterson Institute for International Economies in DC. And he's one of the founding fathers of the think tank Bruegel. Now, let me say that uh, we have here, and it's very impressive, I have to say, three Asian <laughs> panelists out of seven. I think that to capture that uh, structural transformation of first magnitude are emerging in uh, the global economy, it was a very good sign that we could have three speakers coming from Asia. And uh, let, me, let me say just a few words, because uh, we have to be very concise. All panelists have accepted to speak five minutes first in order to communicate their main messages. And then we could have a new round of discussion in order, again, for you to benefit from the multi-angular, multi, uh, I would say, dimensional vision that uh, we have in the panel. And then we go to the, to the audience. So, uh, very rapidly, first, many, many shocks in the global economy since, uh, I would say, uh, the post-World War II and Brighton Wood uh, system and so forth. Each of these shock, collapse of Soviet Union, collapse of the Bretton Woods system, uh, emergence of uh, the emerging world, uh, rise of Asia and of China, very spectacular. Each of these phenomenon would have called for a new 
global economic order, each of them. It's also particularly striking to see, and it was uh, mentioned and stressed very, very well in the previous uh, panel, that uh, there is an acceleration of this transformation. Those structural transformation are accelerating uh, with a remarkable speed. In a way, war in Ukraine is an, illu an emblematic illustration of this uh, incredible and rapid transformation that we are witnessing. Uh, of course, there is a very close correlation between uh, uh, geostrategy and economics. Now, uh, the question, should we have a new international economic order? I, I guess that the response is yes, because checking what has been said, I could see that all speakers, whether president of the US, whether uh, president of all countries in the world, whether president of China, they all say we need a new international order, uh, implicitly or explicitly a new economic international order. So the problem is which one exactly? <laughs> which international order that is new, that would be appropriate to the new world in which we are, would be appropriate? Would, should it be multipolar? or unipolar? The response, yes again, is yes. Yes, we need a new international order. Yes, it should be multipolar, not bipolar. Not m uni unipolar, but again, which kind of multipolar? And then again, I expect all of us to comment on that. Uh, some, of, some have in mind bipolar. They say, yes, implicitly should be West, versus the rest of the world, democracies versus authoritarian regime, global north versus global south, and there are a lot of uh, implicit response on this so-called multipolar world, which in the mind of some would be bipolar. Should it be a real multipolar world with uh, US, Europe, China, the emerging world, Russia, so which constellation of different poles do we see in this uh, new world? And that is, of course, a question for uh, many, many, many countries, many cultures to respond, uh, because it's not obvious which kind of multiple of your uh, world we, we would like to have. And then there is the real question, the dramatic question, shared global rules or no shared global rules. Taking into consideration global public goods or not taking into consideration global public goods at the level of the planet. And again, uh, I, I would say, I hope that uh, the majority of us will say, yes, we need shared rules, we need to recognize that we are in the, on the same planet. But we will see what are the response. And let me turn to the first speaker. Please, you have the floor. OK, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You raised so important but very difficult question. I don't know whether I have an answer to that. Since I'm a trade uh, expert, uh, I will say something about the trade uh, area, uh, starting with a brief uh, remarks on issues uh, <coughs> related to uh, the supply chain, global supply chain, and uh, possibly I want to touch upon the possibility of future world trade governance. I will start with the three major causes uh, for the recent global supply chain restructuring. Uh, first, as you know very well, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the war between Russia and Ukraine and various sanctions uh, against Russia are causing supply chain disruptions. Second, the U.S. measures, uh, trade measures, uh, based on the national security concerns are also causing supply chain distortions. For example, I think you, you, you know this well, uh, very well, additional tariffs on steel and aluminum, uh, also a quota imposed on uh, South Korean steel export and export control on China for semiconductor and semiconductor equipment uh, distorting trade in uh, uh, those uh, products. Third, 
three policies are based on politically motivated uh, nationalism, which prefer domestic uh, production and reshoring, are also causing supply chain restructuring. So all of these are affecting international trade and uh, supply chains of global firms. Looking at these developments, uh, several concerns are emerging. First, uh, we notice that uh, countries like the United States, which have criticized China for giving heavy government subsidies in specific sectors, now provide industrial subsidies to promote their own domestic sector, like a semiconductor. According to U.S. Chips and uh, Science Act, the U.S. government will provide $52 billion of subsidies in semiconductor sector. This means the industrial policies could be revived in most countries, including the United States and probably the EU, triggering uh, industrial subsidies competitions among major countries. We worry that uh, this, uh, might, uh, we might lose the opportunity to uh, reform the rules on industrial subsidies at the WTO. Second, uh, some trade policy measures based on national security concerns, green economy, or politically motivated nationalism, such as those in the U.S. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act, may violate the WTO rules of MFM principle and the national treatment. For example, the IRA includes tax credit uh, provisions which discriminate against electric vehicles produced or assembled outside the North American region. Regarding these aspects of the U.S. Uh, legislation, some trade experts, including those even in the U.S., are questioning whether the U.S. is in support of defending and reforming the rules-based multilateral trading system or simply uh, pushing for anti-China as well as America First policies. The third concern is about the issue of decoupling between the U.S. and China. As you know very well, uh, the U.S. economies and uh, many other economies in the world are already deeply interconnected with the Chinese economy through many years of globalization and trade. Therefore, it may not be realistic and even infeasible to suddenly cut off all trade between the U.S. and China. I think we should consider limiting the U.S. decoupling from China to a few technologically sensitive sectors which are directly related to national security. Even in the case of semiconductor, decoupling should focus on a few technologically advanced chips. Lastly, but not least, I have another concern which is related to the decoupling issues I have just mentioned. We now know that the Indo-Pacific economic framework participating countries are discussing the content of the agreement of the IPEF proposed by the United States. Of course, we, don't know, we do not know the details yet, but probably uh, in the second pillar of economic, uh, in the Pacific economic framework, there will be some provisions for supply chain resilience, which might exclude China in their supply chain for certain products and materials. If this is the case, we can easily expect China to react in one way or another. As, uh, so uh, trade experts are actually saying that, that these kind of uh, confrontation between uh, uh, IPEF uh, participating countries and China might be leading uh, to a serious kind of trade war, uh, which we are really concerned. Well, these are my concerns to share with you. As a trade economist, uh, I do not see the world trade governance, we talk about that in the first session, particularly the multilateral trading system of the WTO, properly deals with these issues, these problems. Furthermore, no major countries formally raise this uh, concern these days. So in this context, I would like to suggest that the WPC participants start to raise appropriate voices. I particularly think that the, our session is the right place to discuss uh, some uh, ideas about the future global trade governors. I don't provide any specific solutions, but I raise the issue. Will I stop here? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Taiwo. It was very, very clear, and uh, this danger of uh, nationalism uh, introducing its own fragmentation 
at the global level and also the decoupling between US and China that you mentioned and the, f the potential war, the potential trade war is extremely important in our perspective. Let me turn to Monsieur Cotton Lem. Que pouvez-vous nous dire, Monsieur? Thank you and good morning. Uh, I cannot tell you if we need a new order if, or if we can tweak the existing order, but I can tell you what I want in it. And I'd like to make this morning two very concrete proposals that I think uh, can contribute to the common good. And I will start, number one, with macroeconomic and financial stability. And in a way, you know, how can we revive the uh, Pittsburgh G20 uh, summit, spirit at least? Uh, something that would have been very useful going back to 2008 uh, is the idea of what I would call a global financial contagion model. So in other words, how can we anticipate domino effects uh, across many counterparties, countries, regions of the world, right? Um, some work has been done already at a country level, usually at the request of a central bank. I'll just name Brazil as an example. You could argue that in the EU, EMIR, which is the European Market Infrastructure Regulation Framework, uh, would have most of the data to perform such an exercise, but we need to actually do it and then do it globally. I think that, that would be very important. More generally, I think it would be very useful to have what I would call a extreme risk measure of the entire world economy uh, across many dimensions, not just market and credit risk, but also climate change, cybersecurity, oper operational risk, you, you name it. Nothing new in a sense. We know we can reuse the models and the stress tests that are already applied to institutions deemed too big to fail. Uh, and once you have what's called in the jargon of, of the regulators a stress value at risk for the entire financial system, you should have the ability to essentially slice and dice uh, amongst all institutions and risk factors so that you can act attribute risk uh, where it belongs. Uh, I think that would be uh, very useful. Of, of course, that will require us to stress test all financial institutions, not just you know, too big to fail, and that includes shadow banking, that includes sovereign states themselves, and, and that includes fintech, and you know, uh, we shouldn't be taken by surprise when um, a cryptocurrency exchange collapses, right? I mean, there's something that doesn't work here. And, and so to conclude on, on this first point, having a common risk framework help us find common interest, which I think is the key to international goodwill, not treaties, not really rules, not really pressure, uh, you name it. So to me, common interest uh, can change the balance of power uh, very little less, else. Uh, so number two in my wish list, and it's quite different, but it's related, equality of opportunity uh, for companies, countries, and of course, uh, individuals. I go much deeper uh, on these issues in my latest book, uh, Le Capitaliste contre les inégalités, but here is a few important points. Uh, first, and I'm talking about companies first, uh, did you know that 1% of companies control 98% of the patents that are actually useful. Uh, it's, it's a staggering number. And so if you look, for instance, at the fascinating example of generic drugs in the United States, uh, it started 40 years ago. Today, 90% of, um, of prescriptions are, are done on the basis of uh, generic drugs. So you may say, well, it's a great success, right? Unfortunately, cost of prescription medicines have continued to increase overall, and, and you could argue that innovation has been deterred by essentially price gouging. Uh, what happened? Well, patents were too much abused. Uh, so this is, to me, a perfect example of excessive rent, and that amounts, in a sense, to what we call in the book, to private taxis, especially if you look at the net effect, right? Because what you see is a rent going from all of us to, say, the top 1% of people, right? So that's highly regressive. 
Uh, and that number exceeds the tax redistribution from the top 1% to the rest of the, uh, of the population. So net-net, you have a fairly regressive uh, impact. Equity is also about fighting externalities, first of all, climate change. And the question is, you know, do you do it according to, say, Nobel Prize winner William Nordhaus by creating a, a club structure with penalties uh, for countries outside the club so we can meet our carbon emission goals much faster than today? Or should we create a compensation scheme for poor countries like uh, the fund proposed by the COP27 just two weeks ago. Uh, in fact, I think we should do both because then you can provide fairness to the system, but at the same time, uh, without perturbing the price signal too much. Uh, I think that's important. And then a final word about equality of opportunity for individuals this time. Uh, the key to me is optimize human capital over the entire life. Uh, of people, and that is tricky for governments because they need to do more long-term planning, right? Always something difficult for governments. So they need to beef up their ability to monitor the performance of public policies better, uh, both in terms of return on investment, and so you can prioritize what you're doing, uh, but also in terms of fairness of the welfare uh, system. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> I take your... Uh, your message uh, as concentrating on maybe uh, let's continue to have a G20, a financial stability board, and all that goes with it continuing to function. And it, it would be part of your message on maintain rules at a global level. And uh, let's not destroy what exists and still exists at the moment we are speaking, even if it is not perfect. And I take your point on fairness for firms, fairness for individuals as a very important message also. Let me turn to Gabriel Felbermeyer. What would you suggest, sir? Thank you, Claude, and thanks for having me. Um, is the global order collapsing? That's the question of this panel. Uh, and I would say it is certainly under tremendous stress, but I don't think it is collapsing. I'd, I'd like to make five points to, to, to shore up that that few. First of all, if you look back in history, uh, Claude, you started with this, I think we have seen crises before. And uh, of course, every crisis we are in right now seems like the biggest we've ever had, but there's been shocks to the global system, the withdrawal, the unilateral withdrawal of the United States uh, in the early 70s from the gold standard then was a big issue and it uh, traumatized many countries, including in Europe. The Bretton Woods system never was a global system, truly speaking. Uh, it was a system for the first world, as we said. The second world, the communist world, was not in. The third world well, mostly was colonized when the Bretton Woods system was uh, engineered. So I think looking back into history tells us that uh, we have had shocks before. And uh, rather than going for collapse, we've seen transformations, and relatively strong transformations, like uh, the uh, change in the early 70s out of uh, the gold standard. The second point I would like to make is uh, we should uh, not only look at the institutions and at the legal compact. Uh, that's, of course, very important, but if we look at outcomes, uh, the picture looks better. Uh, certainly the institutions are in trouble, so the WTO is not having a functional appellate body right now, which is bad, of course. Uh, the IMF has lost ground, uh, bilateralism has, uh, has, Trump, uh, has uh, um, uh, gained ground over multilateralism, and so on. All that is true, but if you look at outcomes, what we see is indeed a surprising degree of resilience. And, uh, you know, that, that the picture and the data that we have is somehow out of sync with much of the discussions we see. For example, trade. So the uh, global financial crisis, 2007 to 9, brought a big recession in trade, and so did the COVID-19 crisis. But then the systems reconverged. So today, the latest, the latest data tell us that the price-adjusted trade is 10% higher at the global level than it was immediately before the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. So we see 
that amount of resilience, and uh, th I think that should give us hope. It means, that's my third point, that the global order is not just about rules and institutions, it is about the whole network of economic ties, about the resilience of uh, a market-based uh, global community. And that resilience, I think, is, is, is great and stronger than uh, what many observers believe. There's co cooperation going on. I mean, we talk a lot about the breakdown of cooperation, and I'm not denying that, but we see cooperation, for example, in the era of uh, international taxation, where the uh, imposition of a minimum tax was an unexpected victory. We see cooperation in the area, in the area of competition policy, no? so that is uh, that's pot potentially a very difficult field, but here things work not, uh, not too badly. And it's interesting that we see cooperation precisely in those areas where we don't have much of an institutional compact. There is no world competition authority, yet we see countries cooperating in this field. And so I think what is really important is that we do have areas where we have a convergence of views, where the epistemics are aligned. Everyone tries, or most countries are convinced that, uh, that excessive market power of very few players is dangerous. Um, most of them believe that we need financial, financial stability. I think there's no doubt about that. And where we have this epi epistemic convergence, I think international cooperation is much easier. My, my, my fourth point uh, is about things that have changed. And I think establishing consensus about that is important to go forward. The first thing that has changed is that global commons matter more than ever. So, despite of talking about deglobalization, we see that what happens around the world is becoming more and more important for our own fates, and that will not change. Climate change is, of course, the big issue, number one, but it goes beyond that. Uh, we have seen the, the pandemic. Uh, we, we, we have concerns about the quality and, and, and the health of our oceans, of biodiversity. We have issues about global terrorism. All these are global comments that m make the world more global and require more cooperation rather than less. The second thing that is, that is I think, important and will stay is that we witness uh, divergence of preferences everywhere, not just between the big blocks. We see that also uh, within Europe, uh, the countries of Europe diverging in views of how the future should look like. We see that also within our own societies, you know, the polarization in the United States, polarization also in European uh, societies is much uh, at, the, at the origin of, uh, of the troubles that we're seeing right now. And the third thing that, that will stay with us is a return of geopolitics and geoeconomics. I think that the period from 1989, say, to 2008 was extraordinary. This very short period, actually, of not even two decades, uh, which is not the historical normal. And so we're going back into, into a situation uh, where countries are at the same time partners, competitors, but also rivals, and have to embrace at the same time a positive sum environment, that's the world of trade and finance, a zero sum uh, environment, that's the world of power struggle where only one, one can win, and a negative sum environment where our actions could, could, re could reduce uh, the, the uh, global prosperity. And the fifth point I would like to touch on is what can be done and what could be lines of, uh, of, of agreement. I think we should indeed focus more on outcomes rather than on the institutional and legal structure. Not saying that the latter are important, but outcomes are what matter finally for people, the environment, for global health, and so on. We should focus more on what works, so a call for pragmatism. And what works today might be very different to what worked five years ago or 15 or 50 <laughs> years ago. I think we should we should uh, have a more broader perspective on the institutions that matter. These are not just IMF, World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, etc. This includes the big multinational enterprises that we need to mobilize for the common good. This in, in, uh, includes the public, uh, the public and, and the civil uh, society, NGOs, and many more. I think we should also look at the future. Now we're talking about China and the United States. What about India? India is overtaking, as we speak, China in terms of its population, and if, it's c if it catches up in terms of uh, GDP per capita, it will outgrow China at some point. What about Africa? Africa will be the place with the biggest uh, population, not far away from us. We should be 
talking about the future and shape institutions that work in the future and not just look at the present. And the last point I would like to make here is that uh, uh, I think there's a minimum consensus where I don't see much divergence, and that is we need transparency. We need uh, transparency about policies. We need a dialogue, and we need um, accountability in the sense that there is monitoring of what's going on by independent institutions that everyone trusts. That is a very short list of minimum requirements, but I think if we can establish that and, uh, and take that out of uh, dispute, then we would be quite uh, some, some, some way further. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Gabriel. I, I take it that uh, all taken into account with all the challenges of all kinds that we have to cope with, you remain confident. You remain confident of what has been done in the past and what should be done and could be done in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Let me turn to uh, Motoshige Ito. Thank you. you. I think uh, the, your first comment about the unipolar versus multipolar globalization is very relevant. When we are thinking about the process of globalization, we probably have to think there are at least two or maybe more different type of globalization and deglobalization. And each has its own momentum. So in order to just to make it point more clear, let me first uh, discuss the case of semiconductor industry, which is maybe typical of the strategic issue which uh, Mr. Park uh, mentioned. Uh, traditionally, the semiconductor industry has expanded and deepened their global division of labor. Uh, typical example is just uh, uh, if you have a uh, iPhone, there's a uh, uh, the semiconductor called the uh, uh, the Logic, which is mostly designed by American companies, and the manufactured by Taiwanese called foundries, and of course using a lot of the materials coming from Japan and Korea, and this uh, semiconductor is actually used by mass production process of iPhone or personal computer in China, so it's a typical globalization. And now what happened is the United States is moving to cut China out of the semiconductor supply chain. And in, that, in addition, the US government is just preparing a huge subsidy to concentrate production bases in the United States. So even for Japanese and probably South Korean, uh, which are requested to participate in this US-centered supply chain, it is not very easy to expand the investment in China at this moment. So there seems to be a very typical uh, the geopolitical movement of the system. And of course, the China is rushing to build a supply chain centered on its own countries. That, that does not depend upon the United States. So this is a part of the, the maybe deglobalization or different type of globalization that we are observing. But if you look at the reality, the, I, I can find, find many other industries of this uh, degree. The, there is, of course, a lot of concern this kind of uh, political movement is spreading to other industries, such as the, uh, the EV, electric vehicle, motor vehicle, or other uh, maybe supercomputers, and so on and so forth. But so far, uh, it is very limited. So it is very important for us to watch how the scope of this kind of process is expanding to other industry or not. And uh, also, we have to just admit, in spite of this fact, the, the quite a large amount of the industry is still uh, conducted under the so-called the flattening of the global economy, which Mr. Thomas Friedman said. I mean, so both the United States and the China depend on each other quite a lot. And so this is different type of the globalization the maybe I should say traditional type of globalization. And the question is whether we can continue this or not. So let me just so discuss the two type of globalization uh, and discuss uh, each element more, different, more carefully. Now, for the first type of globalization, the uh, important thing is uh, in order for the e economy, uh, the This is the advanced technology. So deeper integration or deep, deeper partnership or deeper integration must be not just simple trade. It must be to deal with the strengthening the geopolitical effort 
of uh, the, to promote deeper integration, such as the capital tie-ups, government in, uh, involved support policies, or technical corporations, or the personal exchange. So it is just beyond simple trading. And there's a lot of uh, the kind of a very intimate uh, collaboration is necessary. Now this is, even we can observe this kind of phenomena before US-China uh, division was visible. Like take the case of the a free trade agreement or the, uh, the economic partnership agreement where there is uh, some kind of a limited number of com countries being involved in the, uh, the global deepening. Now, important thing is the, the, the question is whether we can just expand this kind of a partnership among the limited number of companies to uh, the larger number of companies. I mentioned Japan, South Korea, and the United States in my example of semiconductors, but it is very important to include this, uh, the network, the European countries, Oceanian companies, Indian companies, and so forth. And so let me just mention one very famous word by Professor Jagdish Bhagavati of Columbia University. What he said, uh, let me just read. Uh, if uh, the block economy stop at some point of time, that can be a so-called stumbling block for the globalization. But if the block economy is expanding its scope, increasing increasing number of companies, that can be, become a building block for the globalization. Now, reality is when we are thinking about the technology com complication and sophistication of the globalization, this kind of uh, the so-called uh, deepening of the globalization among a few countries may be a very good starting point. And the important thing is we should just expand that, that kind of the globalization to increase the number of the, uh, countries. So this is one part of the globalization. Uh, let me say the second part of the globalization. Uh, I have to say there still is a very large number of industry uh, they faced uh, so-called the, the flattening of the world economy. So the, there's a still very large number of trade and dependence on each other. And the question is whether we can just uh, continue this process. So, so for example, uh, the, the WTO is very important. Also, WTO is now very slow to progress the negotiation. However, it is in increasing more important for each country to adhere to WTO, uh, the rules. And there are many other uh, very important uh, the multilateral uh, scheme for the continuation of the flattening of the economy. And let me finally just mention uh, briefly about just the climate change uh, issues. I'd like to particularly emphasize the importance of effort on climate change. It is necessary, of course, to address the issue of climate change with the participation of the old world's major countries. But at the same time, participation of many countries on cooperative subjects will be important bulwark to <coughs> prevent the global economy from collapsing. So the discussing that kind of the global issue with the increasing number of the uh, countries is also is very important to just continue the process of the globalization. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for putting the finger on technology uh, and uh, this uh, issue of uh, the technological potential divide. Thank you very much. John, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. And uh, thank the organizers, Terry, and the organizers <coughs> for the opportunity to attend this meeting and participate in such a distinguished panel. Uh, the risk at this coming toward the end of a second uh, broad panel on governance is to find that everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. <laughs> so I'm going to limit myself to some broad points that I think are important from a systemic point of view, linked especially to the financial system and the linkage of the trade and financial systems. And my principal conclusion, unsurprisingly, is that a, a more cooperative and coherent 
multilateral approach to setting macroeconomic and financial sector policies will be required in order to achieve shared economic success. And in my view, whether such an approach is possible will be a defining issue of the coming years and decades. And in many ways, what I'm suggesting is not an impossible dream, but rather a return to the much more cooperative environment that animated the response to the global financial crisis, leading to the formation and early success of the G20 leaders process. And I'm going to suggest three areas specific in which will be either viewed as tests or opportunities for progress in the near term. Two will be familiar to you, one will not. It's important, I think, to remember that the post-World War II Bretton Woods system was intended to create a rules-based monetary system that was flexible, both in terms of policy setting, and that would, quote from the Articles of Agreement, facilitate the expansion and balanced growth of international trade, and also would be flexible in terms of governance, in which voting power in the newly created multilateral institutions was to be based on members' relative economic weight a measure that was to be reviewed at least every five years. Uh, there are issues we could discuss on that, but it's and not wanting to sound defensive, but at this time, the top 10 voting members of the uh, IMF are the G7 plus the BRICS minus Canada. So it's, uh, I think it would be hard to, put, to posit a replacement if, among that top 10 and improve represent, re, the representativeness of the, or legitimacy of the institution. That's not to say that what we have now uh, is, is either adequate or ideal. But my, po and my basic point here is that the shared intention of IMF mem members to boost global growth through expanding international trade originally produced a parallel agreement to radically reduce barriers to cross-border international financial flows. And so the current trends toward increased geopolitical friction and new trade protection threatens also to disrupt the international financial system and to undercut the prospects for sustained global growth. Now, it's also worth remembering because the primary post-World War II economic challenge was seen on restoring the international trade system as well as the necessary financing channels, no serious effort was made at that time to create a framework to govern cross-border capital flows. After all, such transactions hardly existed in the immediate post-war era. But as we all know from the mid-1990s mid to the onset of the global financial crisis in 2007, gross international capital flows grew much more strongly than underlying international trade However, it was systemic flaws in the operation of global markets, including poorly drawn perimeters of regulation and inadequate supervisory oversight that contributed directly to the crisis and the ensuing Great Recession. So recognition of these flaws, among other systemic weaknesses, motivated the formation of the G20 leaders process and to the creation of the Financial Stability Board in order to promote financial system resilience and reform. Now, 14 years after the first G20 Leaders Summit, progress has been made on enhancing banking sector stability through the cooperative work of the FSB. However, the same cannot yet be said for capital market regulation. In broad terms, the growth of new forms of non-bank financial intermediaries suggests that both the perimeter and form of financial regulation needs renewed attention. And there has been ex uh, and that, to me, represents a test going forward. Can progress be made on reforming the regulation and the very perimeter of regulation to encompass non-bank financial institutions? In addition, there has been extremely limited progress toward establishing the G20's common framework on debt treatment as a successor to the Paris Club, despite the imminent threat of a new wave of debt defaults among vulnerable emerging and developing economies. And most importantly, the international political arena, we all know and have already been discussed, has become dominated by new geopolitical frictions. At the same time, these frictions have been reflected in measures that have resulted in new trade restrictions and new financial sector sanctions. 
and this is at a time when global growth is slowing and the risk of recession is rising. So I hope that it's, uh, I've made clear why I've concluded that a renewed focus on a more cooperative and coherent approach towards setting macroeconomic and financial sector policy is needed to avoid creating new risks of protectionism and reduced efficiency of international financial markets. Such negative developments inevitably would reduce potential growth and increase economic volatility. Now, two more specific tests looking forward, or tests or opportunities that I would point to. One, as I've just alluded, making the G20's common framework for debt treatment, perhaps with some modifications, a success in providing needed debt restructuring is absolutely critical. It's possible, it would require a more cooperative approach, but without it, trouble is on our doorstep. Second, in the medium term, an area that is almost un unknown and unmentioned, the G20's framework for strong, sustainable balance and inclusive growth, which is the principal, albeit little known, G20 forum for agreeing appropriate economic policies in a cooperative and coherent fashion, needs to be far more forceful and effective than is the case at present. None of this is unimaginable. All of it is possible. And as I've said, the FSB needs to make new progress toward more effective capital market rulemaking. Now, whether all this leads in the long run to new and effective forms of finance, including the possible emergence of a multipolar financial system, should and will be decided by market forces. In sum, since the desire to expand global trade on a multilateral basis was the inspiration for strengthening the global payment system, new trade protection and the proliferation of financial sanctions and other arbitrary barriers threatens to undermine the economic foundations of the rule-based system's historic success in producing global economic growth. Not to be too trite to end, in the words of the great American Francophile, Benjamin Franklin, who told his colleagues drafting the U.S. Constitution, we must all hang together or most assuredly, we will hang separately. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, John. And again, I take it that uh, you are asking the world to continue to go in the direction of shared rules, shared values in the economic front. And uh, you, re you seem to be quite confident that we can continue to proceed which uh, in a world which uh, has never been that challenged is uh, again a demonstration of confidence. Now let me turn to Kiao Ide. Uh, you are here the Chinese citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so we are very carefully listening to what you will say, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, the organizer, to having me here. Um, I guess there's no a consensus on the definition uh, of uh, international economic order. Uh, but it seems to me uh, there should be three components in international economic order. Uh, first of all, uh, it's international organization, economic organization, or people say uh, Britain World Institution, IMF, World Bank, uh, WTO. Uh, secondly, uh, it's uh, international uh, economic uh, law and uh, regulation, uh, which is some involved with these uh, institutions, some not, just uh, John mentioned, like a Paris Club, uh, some written, some unwritten. The, the last one is the uh, international monetary system, uh, which means uh, which currency or which uh, become the, the international currency standard. Um, I have a general uh, judgment uh, on the international economic order after the Second War. Uh, it's provide uh, good public goods, uh, play a positive role to uh, build up a base, uh, which world economy uh, steadily grows uh, in past several decades. But at the same time, uh, it show uh, some shortcomings. Uh, for example, like John mentioned, uh, it hasn't uh, fully uh, provide a benefit of uh, globalization to 
developing countries uh, and uh, other uh, shortcomings. So it's time uh, for uh, reform. How to do that? I want to describe one by one for the each component of economic uh, order. Uh, first of all, for international economic organization, I also want to quote her chance said, um, uh, more power in decision make uh, should more for shift to developing countries. Uh, I guess uh, for G20, uh, Jeff Sachs suggests it should be G21, uh, which including uh, African Union should have a seat on G20. I think it's a good idea uh, for consideration. Uh, second, for international economic uh, regulation uh, and the law, I guess should the stock uh, to uh, keep uh, some of them to keep it. Some of them we have to revise or some of throughout. The last one is add some new regulation along with the development of uh, technology advance. Last for the international um, monetary system, after the collapse of uh, 1917, Britain war uh, collapse, the US dollar became the dominant reserve currency. Uh, in conceivable future, I don't think these patterns will have a fundamental change. But uh, from long term, the multiple reserve currencies, currency system uh, more likely, I'm not going to say definitely will come out, but it's likely, uh, which will provide uh, international liquidity more evenly to, develop to different kind of uh, countries. Uh, people say uh, that will be three pillar uh, system, uh, which means US dollar, uh, uh, EU, and the Chinese renminbi. Uh, in short term, I guess uh, very important for U.S. Uh, should do more macro, uh, should do more cooperation on macroeconomic uh, policy among other uh, major economies. Uh, also, um, currently many experiments for CBDC uh, under the framework of BIS, there are, there are four projects to see whether they can unify some uh, future of the, uh, the CBDC, uh, which I think it's good to facilitate uh, transport, uh, transportation, uh, transaction and the payment system. Um, how the international uh, economic order involve uh, in near future, uh, I guess it will depend the results of two important factors. First of all, it depends on the results of geopolitical evolution. If Russian and uh, Ukraine war wouldn't uh, expand to uh, involve other countries or escalate to high level, if the fric uh, uh, friction and the competition between US and China uh, wouldn't then escalate to conflict, uh, including military conflict. I still can't believe current framework of international economic order uh, will remain existing, although, as I mentioned, it should be reformed. Uh, uh, if not, the whole world, world will be uh, totally fragmented, and the international economic order will completely collapse. The second factor is whether uh, emerging uh, uh, protectionism and anti-globalization uh, would be effectively contained. If not, the global industry chain uh, would greatly uh, disrupted, and the international economic order would inevitably fall into in disorder. I just stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, what you say is uh, extremely important. Your plea for uh, uh, having uh, 
preserving, if I may, <coughs> appropriate order, renewed order, and uh, fight against uh, the deglobalization, anti-globalization phenomenon that is looming in the present world is very, very important. I uh, uh, reserve the right to come back to the international monetary system that you mentioned very wisely. I turn now to Monsieur Véron. You have the floor, my dear. Please. Thank you very much, and uh, particular thanks to uh, the World Policy Conference, uh, and especially Thierry and Song Nim for including me. Um, it's a particular privilege for me to be in this panel under the chairmanship of uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, who is also the honorary chairman of Bruegel. Uh, you mentioned uh, my affiliation there, uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, I also want to apologize for being another male panelist in an old male panel, uh, and uh, I am conscious of participating in a clearly suboptimal outcome he here, but here we are. Um, the question is, uh, the, is the international economic order collapsing? Uh, and uh, I will uh, again uh, give, a, give another uh, attempt to answer this, and, and, and the answer is no. There is every reason to be concerned these days. I think we all have them in mind, and they have been uh, analyzed already uh, by a number of participants. Uh, there is a massive uncertainty. I think this is a dominant uh, characteristic of the current moment, that we don't know uh, a number of fundamental things, even in the very short term. And what happened in China in the last few weeks uh, was a, a reminder of that. Uh, there are some very uh, basic uh, premises of how we look at the world uh, that we cannot be completely sure of. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, climate change is a, a massive challenge. We're uh, losing the race against time in addressing it. So I'm not advocating complacency here, let me be very clear. But we don't see a collapse in sight of the order. I think the, the international economic order actually is surprisingly resilient. What happened this year? Uh, I was at the World Com uh, Policy Conference uh, last year. I was privileged to be uh, also here in Abu Dhabi at the other side of town. Uh, and uh, since then, extraordinary events have, uh, have been happening. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Um, the consequence has been Russia being isolated in the international system and to a large extent taken out of it. So uh, ring fence from the international economic system as opposed to this conflict leading to a collapse of the system. I think nobody put what the, the gist of what happened more eloquently than uh, actually two days before the invasion, uh, the Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations, Martin Kimani, uh, who, uh, as probably many of you remember, uh, made that point that what Russia was at the time threatening to do, the invasion of Ukraine, was an absolutely fundamental <coughs> challenge to all the norms that bind us together on this planet. And so the response, in terms of international economic institutions, has been forceful, but I would say proportionate, in terms of the extraordinary violation of norms that we have seen, and an extraordinarily forceful response. So let's uh, look at what I mean by resilience very quickly. The WTO, Mr. Pogam reminded us that uh, it's still there and running even after the aggression of the Trump administration. Uh, the G20, we had, to my mind, a very successful summit in Bali, which kind of illustrates what I'm talking about, including some strong wording in the final declaration compared to what I think everybody was uh, expecting. And I think the Indonesian presidency of the G20 uh, deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, John Lipsky reminded us of the challenges and the need for the common framework uh, to make progress. That's, we're getting a li little bit into the weeds here, but, uh, but I think if you look at, for example, the restructuring of, uh, the announced restructuring of the debt of Zambia, we see uh, a possibility of some constructive evolutions, especially in the main challenge to the IMF these days, which is the interplay between Chinese lending to a number of uh, developing and emerging countries and the traditional framework embodied by the Paris Club. So I'm not saying the problem is resolved here. I'm just saying that the worst case scenarios are not materializing. 
the World Bank, it has been uh, mentioned by somebody in the audience, is still led by uh, uh, somebody who has uh, taken positions close to climate, deni climate change denial, but it remains a strong institution. Uh, let's talk about finance, because that's uh, the area I specialize in most. The Basel III Accord on Banking, um, Capital Requirements, Leverage, uh, Liquidity and uh, Stress Testing has been an extraordinary international success. It's been implemented in a more globally consistent way than the previous Accord of Basel II. Uh, sadly, the European Union is still not compliant, but most other ju jurisdictions are, and I think that has led to great resilience uh, in the financial system, in the banking system, as we have seen with the COVID-19 shock and with the shock of the Ukrainian uh, war. The Bank for International Settlements has echoing what I was saying about the violation by Russia of international norms, for the first time that I'm aware of, applied international sanctions on Russia, one of its members, one of the members also of the Financial Stability Board, showing uh, the effectiveness of collective discipline in the system, I would argue. Uh, I'm not aware that the BIS had ever participated in international sanctions before, with the possible exception of uh, freezing the assets of the Central Bank of Yugoslavia, but that was after Yugoslavia no longer existed. We also have seen that challenges to the international economic and financial orders have not been very successful. Uh, I'm not going to expand on crypto uh, these days. Uh, we don't see, either from Russia or China, for in very different uh, environments, attempts to... Um, we don't see successful attempts to replace the basic infrastructure of the global financial system, payments, messaging, SWIFT, uh, uh, the um, uh, international uh, transaction settlement through CLS uh, group and, and uh, infrastructures of the same nature. And finally, as Gabriel has mentioned, we even have unprecedented progress, unfinished of course, uh, in an area which until now had been completely immune to that kind of collective cooperation, which is taxation with the efforts of the OECD, uh, unfinished business to say the least, but the fact that this has even been possible to initiate, uh, I think, has to be taken as a step forward uh, that has happened under difficult circumstances. And of course, the EU, the European Union, which uh, I come from and which is the most advanced uh, exercise in uh, supranational economic and political cooperation, uh, has been built on rejection of economic nationalism with coal and steel in the first place. Uh, well, it has faced an existential crisis, but it has overcome it. Certainly, it has lost an important member, the United Kingdom, but uh, on many uh, parameters, it's now stronger uh, than ever. And we've seen that with the next generation EU a program of uh, borrowing and spending, which is the first time on this scale that the EU has been able to finance itself on its own uh, at the European level uh, with a redistribution against, uh, among its countries. So, uh, as I said, no complacency. Uh, we, need, uh, we don't need to replace this system, and I think that echoes what, what Chao Yi did just said. China is not asking for the replacement of the system. It's uh, asking rightly for its reform and transformation. Um, I'm talking about the official discourse of China here. Uh, one thing I will say, there have been many ideas already uh, put forward for uh, reform, and uh, I'm not going to repeat things that have already been said. I will just say as a European, I think Europeans have to be proactive in creating space uh, for other jurisdictions in a changing world, maybe echoing what Aminata Toure was saying in the first panel. Uh, when you look at the things I focus most on, the BIS, the Basel Committee, the Financial Stability Board, Europeans are clearly massively overrepresented in that infrastructure. They, 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 there is absolutely no reason that in the Basel Committee you would have seven individual countries of the Eurozone <coughs> represented individually together with the ECB. So that has to change. Uh, Europeans need to take the initiative and uh, provide uh, for more balanced uh, representation, particularly of East Asia, but also of the Middle East, <coughs> Africa, and Latin America. Let me conclude on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, strong plea for the Europeans to be less numerous, <laughs> but as influential <laughs> as they are, but less numerous <coughs> in many uh, of these uh, groupings. So thank you very, very much. 
uh, I have to say that times is elapsing quite rapidly. I understand that we have to uh, leave the room at 11.30. Am I right to say that? I'm asking the organizers. Uh, if it, will, it is the case that we have to leave the room at 11.30, then I would go directly to the audience, if you permit, unless one of us wants to make a point and contradict <laughs> violently <laughs> what has been said by another panelist. But I don't see that uh, you are asking for such a quarrel, if I may. Among, not a, a, a good quarrel, I mean, this kind of debate that we, we like very much. But I turn then to the audience, and I see one hand raised over there, and over there, and over there. So please. Uh, the mic is there, and then you, you will have the floor afterwards, madame, immediately after. Please. Uh, merci, Monsieur Trichet. It's Steve Erlanger, New York Times. Um, very good panel. Just given time, I want to ask, given the sanctions on the Russian Federation because of the Ukraine war, what lessons, Mr. Chow, and others is China drawing from these sanctions? And how can it alter the current system to avoid that kind of pressure in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps we will have another question and then we go to the panel. Madam. Well, it would say that this is not going to be the last crisis, but let's be careful because some crises led to worldwide catastrophe. So I think, you know, let's be aware of that. Uh, but my point was about women. This panel doesn't reflect the contribution of women into the global economy, obviously. Although we have to improve um, uh, their presence. But uh, a very interesting report of the IMS is saying that if we have more than 40% of women in the global economy, if we increase it, the United States would have a boost of 5% of its GDP. Um, in Egypt, it would be 34% of the GDP. In Africa, it would be even more. So don't you think that we need to change the pattern uh, you know, of this you know, global economy we're talking about, and, and make it more gender sensitive as you're sitting here. Um, I don't think you reflect what the, how much we work as women in the world. Thank you very much for this remark. I was expecting, I applaud. <laughs> I think that none of us is responsible for the composition of the panel, to be frank. <laughs> but you, you, you made the point very good. Please, last question, and then we turn to the panel. Uh, thank you. Two, two brief questions. One is, it seems that most panelists have commented on the international aspects of the international economic order. But there are domestic dimensions to it as well. There are domestic infrastructure, uh, uh, foundation for the international economic order. So maybe the international economic order is not collapsing, but the domestic dimensions are increasingly at odds with what the international economic order implies. And it was mentioned in the first panel that there were difficulties within the societies themselves. So how do you uh, address that, that issue? And second, uh, Mr. Felbermeyer um, started by saying that the international order is not collapsing, that it had shown a, a, a lot of resilience, so it has adapted. But then he identified a number of challenges that may lead to a question about the virtue of adaptation. Because this adaptation has come through a succession of crises. And these crises are increasingly frequent and increasingly costly. So is this a model that we want, or do we need a recreation of this international economic order? So I stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think that we could start responding to the first three questions. Who wants to take the floor immediately? Yes? OK. Because I'm the only Chinese in the panel, so it's naturally for me to answer the question regarding yeah. the uh, uh, how China can learn some experience from Russia-Ukraine uh, war. 
I guess the question has many implications behind the question itself. Um, first of all, probably I have to point out the gov Chinese government official position uh, is uh, along with uh, India, Indonesia, South Africa, uh, many developing countries, which is uh, they don't support the Russian invasion to Ukraine. They think it's violate the principle of the United Nations. But at the same time, they're not necessarily uh, support US and Western countries to have a section against Russia from many different uh, perspectives. Because in China, the government official will think that way. Even we support US sanction Russia, but US still will keep pressure regarding China as a major rival. Why I should do that? that that's my uh, interpretation. Second uh, implication, I guess I understand many um, coverage of media always uh, link between Russia-Ukraine relation and the mainland China and the Taiwan. I recall several years ago, also here in panel, I, that time I point out, because many people point out to me, how about South China Sea conflict with uh, Crimea, that time because uh, 2014, Russian took over Crimea. So many people make a comparison. At that time, I say, I don't think it's right to make such kind of comparison. Why? Because Crimea is very clear. Uh, is at least in past several decades, it's uh, international recognized as a part of uh, Ukraine. South China Sea Island, not is just some no, no people living island. Some country claim belong to them. I guess that difference is very important. By the same thing, same line of thinking, I don't think it's right to make comparison directly between mainland China and Taiwan and the Russia and the Ukraine because internationally recognize Taiwan province is a part of China. Many international uh, treaty recognize. Having said that, doesn't mean I advocate or I support mm -hmm. Chinese government that should take a military action against Taiwan. I'm not. But the sensitive here, if someone wants to push Taiwan to extreme as an independence, nothing can be happen. That, that's my answer. That's very, very clear, I have to say. Thank you very much indeed for what you just said, which uh, takes uh, every issue uh, directly and uh, without, uh, I would say, uh, uh, too much complication. <laughs> You're direct, clear. Thank you very much indeed. I have to turn to Tayo. Yes, yeah, uh, please. I want to uh, respond to the question on domestic uh, policy environment uh, regarding globalization on trade. Definitely more and more people, ordinary people, think of globalization and trade in a negative way. Because it's simple, because they think they lose their job because their own companies are leaving their countries and invest in other countries. Or they are importing too much so that uh, you know, domestic production is, is being decreased. So you know, I'm a professor for international trade for 30 years. I'm persuading my student and teaching my student that's not correct, you know. There are other reasons to cause this kind of thing and income inequalization, but people's you know, perception is going that way, and uh, wisely the politicians are using that kind of sentiment to produce more uh, protectionist measures. So uh, what I'm saying is here, preaching or, or persuading the people who are having difficulties in their own economy is not enough. Uh, I think we have to find out some solutions, policy measures. We have a so-called inclusive trade policy measures. It sounds very nice, but no, no substantial uh, content in it. Yeah. So we have to find out something 
to really substantially help those people who are having difficulties from many other reasons. This is my comment on that. Very clear, very clear. Yes, Jan. thank you. I'd like to reply to Mrs. Touré very, very quickly. I think you brought up a very good point about diversity and equality of opportunity. I think you need incentive and more efficient public policies. Incentives are there, that's good news. I think the business community is realizing that it's good for their bottom line. So you gave a, a set of stats. There's a different study that shows that if you increase black American participation in the U.S. economy, you can also generate about 5% of increased GDP. That's about $1,000 billion every year. That, that's fantastic. And, and the business community is already realizing that. So it's there, right? In terms of public policies, you have the national level, and then you have the uh, international level. And I just want to mention one specific program that the EU put together during COVID, which I think was very good, it stands for SURE, and it's the temporary support to mitigate unemployment risk in an emergency, which is basically a second pillar on top of national unemployment systems to uh, basically provide some um, uh, solidarity and, and make the system more resilient and, and provide ultimately more equality of opportunity. Right. Thank you very much, Jan, indeed. And again, uh, Madame, we all agree on the fact that <laughs> this is not a normal composition of the panel, and we have no responsibility in that, but the message is loud and clear. And thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, Mr. Ito, you thank have you. the floor. Yeah, I have a just a response to the final question about the adaptation of the globalization process from the picture of the Tom Friedman. Now, when we are thinking about the process of globalization, there's at least four, or maybe more, different trends. One is multilateral approach. The second is a regional type of approach. And th third is the bilateral, two-country negotiation approach. And maybe fourth is unilateral action, where each own country can just move unilaterally. And the actual process of the globalization is just a combination of the four. And sometimes, maybe multilateral approach is just moving very quickly. But sometimes, this multilateral approach is stumbling. Then we need more effort on the regional effort or maybe bilateral effort. And probably because of the geopolitical issues and other issues just we discussed, the, the trend is a little bit changing from just a multilateral approach to the more realistic regional or bilateral. <coughs> but I'm not sure whether this is just the continuing or, or maybe we need more effort to just strengthen the multilateral approach to the globalization. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Do we have other remarks or questions, uh, uh, answer to questions, uh, if I may? Uh, we had the, the uh, international monetary system that you, you mentioned, uh, uh, and I would only say in this domain, clearly the moment the renminbi becomes a full convertible currency, I'm speaking under the control of John, we are changing the international monetary system. Uh, at the present moment, the renminbi is in the basket of the SDR as the one of the five. And, uh, and of course, it was a major, major move, a major change. Now, it does not, uh, I would say, align with the functioning of the system today. But again, as soon as the renminbi is convertible, full convertible currency, you change the system. And let me whilst I'm mentioning the SDR and, uh, and the international moner monetary <coughs> system, there has been a consequence of the last big crisis of Lehman Brothers, which is not sufficiently underlined, in my opinion. After Lehman Brothers crisis, after the great financial crisis, all central banks of the advanced economies that are in the basket of the SDR, the four, namely the yen, the sterling, the dollar, and the euro, decided, all of them, not because there was an agreement or a negotiation, but because it was their own sentiment that it would better anchor the expectations, they all have the same definition of price stability, namely 2%, around 2% in the medium term. It is the definition of price stability in Japan, in the US, in Europe, in the UK. And I have to say that uh, 
China itself is not far from the 2%. So all that taken into account, it seems to me that it is a silver lining in the global system because before we had no joint definition or agreed uh, nationally, but uh, converging internationally definition of price stability. It's been reaffirmed by all countries concerned, central bank concerned, uh, heads of central bank concerned in the US, in Europe, in the rest of the world. And again, I take it that it is uh, something which is in a very difficult world, in a very hectic world, very complicated, full of challenges. It is one of the silver lining that we might have. Another silver lining, but it was mentioned by many, is that the G20 continues to work and continues to, I would say, give the appropriate political backing for a number of things that are very important. John mentioned that, and all speakers mentioned, mentioned that. And I take it also that on the environment front, in a world which is again so divided, the fact that we created a new International Sustainable Standard Board in Glasgow and confirmed in the recent uh, Egyptian COP. So it's extremely important. Uh, we all agreed that we were on planet Earth, that it was our spaceship, and we had to care for our spaceship. And uh, it was not obvious that we would have a consensus on this new international board, but we, we had it. So uh, I think that I am called to interrupt now the panel. At least it is what is written in the program. So let's respect the program. And let's thank you very, very much indeed. <laughs>